Good morning, everyone. Uh, the topic of discussion today is developmental hip dysplasia, and the article we're using as a base for that is titled Congenital Hip Disease in Adults. Um, two authors are uh, T. Karakalios, who's a, um, a Greek chap who practices adult reconstructive surgery. Um, he's got 92 publications, has written 11 chapters, and has over 920 sites. Uh, the co-author of this uh, review article is um, Harto Philokides. He has 21 publications and is the um, original uh, proponent of the classification system that will be discussed. This article is a review article that appeared in the JVJS Aspects of Current Management series. It covers, it covers the definition of uh, developmental hip dysplasia classification systems that are used and the way in which those classification systems are used for preoperative planning in adults. Um, there are also some recommendations made on operative management for the, the development to hip dysplasia in adults. Um, by way of background, I'll turn to the textbooks. Um, the authors here are using congenital hip disease as a term for what we currently refer to as de developmental dysplasia of the hip. Um, term, which is a relatively new term, formerly was known as congenital dislocation of the hip. Um, the use of congenital hip disease puts an adult perspective on what is largely discussed as a paediatric condition. Um, so in the child, DDH represents a spectrum of disorders, which includes acetabular dysplasia without displacement, instability, um, subluxation and dislocation, and the source I used included teratological forms of misarticulation under the title uh, DDH. Uh, the for, the benefit, for my benefit and for the medical students, uh, the risk factors are involved in developing DDH. Um, there's genetic influences, a familial inheritance is seen, and there's also uh, an increase in DDH in Mediterranean populations. I thought that hormones could have something to do with the development of DDH, um, high levels of maternal estrogen, progesterone, and relaxin during the late stages of pregnancy. Um, this is just the laxity around the hip. Um, Physical parameters such as intrauterine malposition, um, breech position at birth, and vertex presentation, and also biomechanical factors after birth, um, the hip position being nursed. Suggesting that um, hips that are actively adducted as a child is uh, carried on one's back um, are more, uh, more likely to not develop DDH, whereas those which are nursed with the, the legs together are less likely. Um, the pathology involved, at birth, the capsule is stretched and redundant um, in children who have DDH. During infancy, um, the femoral head dislocates posteriorly, migrates posterolateral and then supralateral. Uh, the acetabulum itself becomes shallow and antiverted. Uh, the bony nucleus of the femoral head appears later and ossification is delayed. The capsule is stretched, the ligamentum teres becomes elongated and hypertrophy, and the fibrocartilaginous limbus may form when the labyrinth and the capsule are squeezed by the into the acetabulum by the dislocated femoral head. Um, once weight-bearing starts, these features um, progress. The acetabulum and femoral head remain antiverted. Femoral head may form a false acetabulum above the true acetabulum, and the capsule can take on a stretched, tortuous hourglass appearance. Um, again, for the medical students, this is just a pictorial indication of the management options which are available um, to treat uh, DDH when it's caught early, and they progress from, uh, from infancy right through to um, adolescence, um, from top left down to the right, bottom right-hand side. And so there you can see the pavlic harness, closed reduction arthrotomy, hip spiker, um, type, uh, type of open reduction, femoral shorting and an osteotomy, um, and then other forms of on the acetabular, acetabular, more osteotomies. I'll continue. Um, when approaching this um, in an adult population, uh, as, a, as a, a legacy of the DDH suffered as a child and as a legacy of the um, attempts to correct it, um, anatomical changes are found. So femoral head is small and deformed, the neck it becomes narrow and short with varying degrees of antiversion. Uh, the dratic trochanter shifts position and becomes smaller and becomes more posterior. Uh, the femoral canal is much more narrow than compared to other adult populations. Um, the proximal third of the, anterior, of the femur can have an anterior bow, giving subluxation or dislocations that create the false acetabulum. Um, 
and there can be thin and poor bone stock within that fox acetabulum. Uh, the true acetabulum has the strongest bone stock. There's a couple of images that I've pulled from the review article to, to demonstrate the small femoral head, short and necked, the anti version. There are soft tissue considerations as well. Because of the uh, in reaction or perhaps in concert with these bony changes, uh, the abductors are poorly developed and orientated more transversely. The abductors, solus, hamstring, and rectus femoris are shorter than normal and may require tenotomies at the time of correction, uh, corrective surgery. Capsules are elongated and redundant, and the sciatic nerve is never assumed as normal length, and during operations can be susceptible to stretch. Um, in order to approach these um, graduates of childhood developmental dysplasia of the hip, um, in late, late 70s, a classification system to help divide the types of um, hip dysplasia that's seen in adults and to guide operative therapy, um, a, a classification system was developed as the Crow classification system. <coughs> in the original article, uh, 34 hips uh, were, um, hips with developmental, uh, developmental dysplasia of the hip were picked up and were followed through for a five year period. Uh, varying degrees of pathology were seen in these, in these examples. Um, migration was then calculated using a vertical distance between the inter teardrop line and the medial head neck junction of the involved hip. There's some grammatical areas on that slide, I apologise. Um, and subluxation is then uh, calculated as a ratio of the distance between the inter teardrop line and the medial head neck junction, and in comparison to the vertical distance of the opposite femoral neck. Uh, the main correlation um, in this initial paper between underlying pathology, uh, which is seen at, at operative time, um, and CRO classification was only uh, mentioned in type 2 and CRO 2 and CRO 3 classification. They required more bone graft at the time of operation. That's the initial paper. Subsequent papers went on to develop the classification system further. Um, so this is uh, an image I pulled from the original paper. The teardrop on the, the pelvis is a small uh, radiological feature which is seen medial to the acetabulum wall. And this line um, uh, under the drop on this side. So the line is created across uh, on both sides. Um, and the distance between this line and the medial um, neck head angle, the distance from this uh, so on this side, the, the obviously dysplastic hip, the measurement of approximately three and a half centimetres is made. Then that measurement is then compared in a ratio, is compared to the, the vertical height of the femoral neck on the opposing side, and is, that is used to derive the degree of subluxation. Turn back to this slide. Type 1, there's less than 50%. Type 2, 50 to 75%. Type 3, um, more again and type 4 greater than 100%. So as that teardrop line to uh, medial femoral neck angle height increases, the degree of subluxation increases as well, resulting in a higher crow classification. Um, the correlations that have been found subsequently uh, between the crow classification and what is seen intraoperatively are the type 1, the mild subluxation, um, has a shallow acetabulum. Type 2 and 3 develop a superior acetabular defect. And the, in type 3, the femur is lateralised um, and the soft tissue surrounding the attachment to the femur is lateralised also. In type 4, there's a high dislocation. Uh, the acetabulum, the remaining true acetabulum is hyperplastic and has an intact superior rim. Uh, the femur and the soft tissues are lateral. So that's by way of background, and uh, a quick review of what's known and, and working knowledge regarding development of dysplasia of the hip. Um, I'll then move on, I'll now move on to the recommendations made by um, the authors of the article and discuss them in turn. So the first recommendation is that uh, when approaching this condition from an adult perspective is that we move away from the term developmental dysplasia of the hip and instead replace it, uh, replace it with a term congenital hip disease. Uh, the, the perspective of the authors is, is demonstrated when I, I, this is the online index for Campbell's Operative Orthopaedics. Um, this 
This reference here, 372 to 79, um, is the summary of the, the working knowledge regarding DDH in adults, whereas these here, some 40 pages, is the, the knowledge and operative procedures for uh, DDH in children. Um, their, their suggestion is that we could continue to use the, the classification that we see already for DDH in that there's acetabular dysplasia or there's subluxation or there's dislocation. That could remain. And under the, the broader banner of congenital hip disease, um, in adults we could describe it as hip dysplasia, low dislocation or high dislocation, which you'll see shortly uh, corresponds with the, uh, the new classification system they propose. Their argument for this is that subluxation doesn't reflect what is actually happening at the acetabulum in adults, and a developmental dysplasia of the hip doesn't actually reflect the congenital aspect of the condition. Uh, that's at odds with my, my relatively recent work. The second recommendation they go on to make is that uh, we move away from the Crow classification and towards the Hartofilakides classification. I'll talk about how that was um, developed now. The authors, um, uh, retrospectively and prospectively, uh, uh, found 430 cases of adult graduate DDH that they had, had been consulted for, for ongoing pain problems. Operative reports were consulted and with radiographs to the hip. And of these, a subset of 42 went on to have uh, CT with 3D reconstruction of the pelvis and the hip itself. Um, another subset, there, were no, there was another subset of 66 patients who went on to have total hip replacement for this condition between the time period noted um, and required acetabuloplasty at the time. Um, I'll return to that sub point shortly. Um, Broadly, when they, they found three distinct patterns, which isn't all that uh, far removed from the Crow classification, but is yet still subtly different. Um, when they looked at the x-rays, they found that there were three, tended to be three features. A dysplasia, a low hip dislocation, or a high dislocation. Um, for those that were dysplastic, the femoral head was still in the true acetabulum. The patients that they described as having a low dislocation, the femoral head still artic was articulating with a false acetabulum, which was partially covering the true acetabulum, so it was uh, a little continuous. There were those that had a high dislocation where the femoral head was well outside the true acetabulum and had uh, migrated post uh, superiorly. This was then correlated with anatomical changes seen, um, picked up on operation reports and seen um, on the 3D reconstructions of the CTs for the subset. Um, and, correlated, and correlated to their X-ray findings. So the first type, the dysplastic type, um, all of these 325 had a superior acetabular segment deficiency and a shallow acetabulum. Of the 43 patients of their series that had low dislocation, um, there were anterior and posterior segment deficiencies, a narrow acetabular opening, inadequate depth, increased antiversion, a smaller number, 32, and some a loss of posterior bone stock in four of those. Out of those that had the high dislocation, there was a segmental deficiency of the entire acetabular ring. Uh, there was a narrow opening, there was shallow depth, uh, the true acetabulum had excessive antiversion, and there was an abnormal distribution of bone stock. So bone stock in the true acetabulum, was, uh, in the pelvis, sorry, was um, So, just to this is an example of one of the 3D CT reconstructions. The femur and the, the head of the femur have been removed. And the arrows show this is a, a low dislocation. Um, and you can see the true acetabulum down the bottom continues with the false acetabulum more superiorly. <coughs> Another CT 3D reconstruction. Uh, this is a high dislocation. Um, you can see uh, inferiorly within the circle is a, a dysplastic, triangular-shaped true acetabulum, <coughs> and much more superior that the cusps of a, the false acetabulum <coughs> where the femoral head is now now resides. Um, between low dislocation and high dislocation, <coughs> uh, the creators of the, the classification system noticed it was a spectrum. Um, while all had uh, anterior and posterior segment deficiencies and changes in the the increased antiversion was seen in the more severe cases and the low, loss of posterior bone spectrum seen in the most 
So by way of comparison, how do the two compare? Um, so there were three studies uh, cited that looked into this. Uh, when you compare the two classification systems, um, within each classification system, uh, the crow, system, uh, crow was quite reliable. The figures quoted, uh, quoted there are, are kappa coefficients, and they are, they are a number from zero to one, and they give you an indication of the agreeability between observers. So a uh, kappa of one um, indicates perfect agreement. Uh, a kappa of 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 is suggested to have um, significant agreement. Um, so you can see across with within the, the classification system, but across the different observers, there was significant agreement for the crow classification and the heart ocular feedings. When single observers were put to task and um, asked to compare the same X-ray again and again, they were able to reproduce it with a producing kappa of greater than 8, of 0.86 and 0.79. Um, another study looked at just the um, heart ocular uh, killer feedies classification alone and found that between three observers there was a, a cap of 0.72 to 0.85 again significant agreement and when the when asked to predict what anatomical changes they would expect and the and that was compared with the operative findings there was significant agreement again now the third evaluation looked at used three surgeons looking at 209 osteoarthritic hips, so not developmentally dysplasia on the hips. Um, and again showed significant uh, inter-observer reliability and intra-observer um, consistency. So while, this, while these evaluations show that the, the heart ocular feedies classification system is valid, there doesn't appear to be any overwhelming um, superiority of one system over the other in terms of its use by observers. I'll continue. Um, so moving away from a proposed new classification system, uh, the, the paper then uses their extensive canon of, of um, uh, patients that they've operated on in publications to come up with some, some recommendations for surgeons who are approaching um, surgery, total hip replacement, for adult patients presented with a DDH. Um, so I'll go through each problem in turn, the suggested solution by the paper and the evidence that they've cited. I'll squeeze through the last, these recommendations and wrap up. Um, so in terms of, for evaluating bone stock, uh, the size and location of defects, the size of the acetabulum and the antiversion of the femoral, femoral neck, uh, pelvic radiographs are suggested for the, the bone stock, um, femoral radiographs for the antiversion of the femoral neck, and CT with 3D reconstruction for the diameter and depth of the, the acetabulum. That came off the paper which looked at um, 175 hips with low and high dislocations. At that time of um, operation, in order to um, permit sufficient access to the hip joint itself and to afterwards correct biomechanics in these deranged um, hips, the, the authors do suggest that a, a graded trochanter osteo be part of a standard approach and not just part of a, um, an, a PRN approach. Uh, not new evidence, this is from, um, from a book published by Charlie. But they use evidence from, uh, they use that as their citing evidence. Um, when positioning the acetabular component for a total hip, they suggest that the level of the true acetabulum is the place to put it, and not the false acetabulum. And they refer to uh, a study of 95 um, Charlie low friction arthroplastics. Um, they found, when they reviewed radiographs, that there were favourable signs when the medial centre of the rotation was in the level of the true acetabulum, not in the pulse. In terms of the type of acetabular component that you use, they broke it down into how much um, bone stock you could look forward to when you put in the acetabular cup. Expected to have more than 80%, uh, a monoblock or a ceramic one on ceramic um, acetabular cup was the main suggestion. Um, they've, they've gone, deliberately gone for these designs because they've found uh, a comparison of uh, 46 hips, uh, found all of which had um, uh, polyliners inserted, had a very high rate of polyliner revision at two years because of high levels of wear. Um, with the monoblock, they found, they looked at, they used a, a um, 
series of 245 hits which had a combination of osteoarthritis, AVN and DDH, and found that a monoblock um, acetaminophen had higher surveillance to ship at three years. And when it came to um, making a recommendation that ceramic and ceramic might be an option, um, they again referred to low levels of revision of 53 hits um, with CT ceramic, navigated ceramic on ceramic THR at six years. No, no, suggest, no specific clarification of what the underlying pathology was in those. If it was, there was less than 80%, they suggested a technique called um, a, a cotyloplasty, another good leaf leader, I apologise, uh, which essentially, essentially is a medialisation procedure of the true acetabulum. If they couldn't get more than 80% bony coverage, what they would do is using a reamer, uh, a reaming tool, they would then fracture the acetabulum medially, then take bone graft from the excised femoral head uh, and mould it across before inserting a cemented or an uncemented prosthesis. And then afterwards, the patient would have to be non weight bearing on that side until there was evidence of, of movement. I'll, I'll continue. Um, when approaching the problem of high failure rates with the superior, um, if, a, if the acetabulum has an allograft or autograft um, to the superior segment of the acetabulum, um, there's a higher failure rate. Uh, the suggested solution is that um, if you try and get more than 70% osseous coverage in post foam, which then relates back to the, the concept that they're suggesting this medialisation of the acetabular approach. Uh, that came from a, a, a large series of 2,308 total hip replacements done for dysplastic hips. Um, can the false acetabulum be used for acetabular position? The authors don't re recommend it, and they refer back to bio biomechanical principles for that. In the lever arm that you create um, is longer than the abductors, and it leads to excessive load of the hip. And you get away with cementless femoral components. Um, again, it wasn't recommended. Um, if you did want to, you could consider using custom-made femoral components. Uh, avoiding cementless femoral components was the, was the author's own opinion, um, and using the custom-made um, it came from a, an operative technique piece where 119 plastic hips had custom-designed femoral prosthesis based on a CT pre-op. There's no follow-up of these hips to see how well they went afterwards, only that at time of operation they were inserted successfully. Um, in terms of what a sort of approach a surgeon should make for correction of a high dislocation, um, their, their recommendation overwhelmingly is that there is a high, um, a high dislocation with a, a proximal malformation that you do a metaphyseal osteotomy in preference to subtrochanteric or diaphyseal. Um, the, the, the evidence for a metaphyseal osteotomy comes from the author's own opinion again, and that's in that the, the greater trochanter sits higher uh, than the centre of rotation in these high dislocation hips and needs to be brought down and corrected. Um, another recommendation made if there is a, a valgus uh, knee deformity that that be corrected, and that came from the same series of, of more than 2,000 hips. Uh, so I'll just wrap up now. Um, in terms of uh, my sort of summation for the, for the topic, it appears to be this is a niche area which is still the, the approach to adult, management of the adult uh, dysplastic hip and ongoing problems with the, the childhood dysplastic hip in adulthood um, is a relatively small area, still emerging. Um, the, the recommendations and the, the evidence put forward here can be quite helpful. Uh, the proposition that we change the, the definition for the for just uh, CH to CHD. I think it's admirable, but it probably won't gain traction outside of specialist circles to see this sort of supervision. Um, I personally, as a, as a relatively new orthopedic registrar, I found the pro classification confusing and difficult to, uh, to learn initially. Um, and, the init and the initial derivation was based on small samples using a single radiological modality. Whereas these days we have the benefit of CT and CT reconstruction. Whereas the Hardo Achillopedes classification, relatively straightforward to interpret and to apply. Um, the initial derivation of it is based on large numbers and potentially has a larger, more powerful anatomical application 
correlation between the hip position and the pain. Okay, so comments and questions? <coughs> 